A recent study claimed vegans have more bone fractures. Is this true? You know, it, it, this comes back to the concept that I, I worry about a great deal. It's called reductionism. You know, researchers, and they have been doing this for a long time, especially even more so in these days, it seems like to me, you can pull out one study here, one study there, one nutrient here, one mechanism here, one disease, and you can find out almost anything you want to find out and then make a big story. Uh, that it's, it's really not, not true. If you, in the whole food, it's very different. And on the question you were just raising about bone fracture rates, uh, yes, what we see is that the higher, this is comparing populations consuming different amounts of animal protein in this case again, the higher the consumption of animal protein, the greater is the fracture rate. The higher the consumption of calcium in different countries, the greater the fracture rate. So where do we get our animal protein and calcium from? Dairy. So the higher the consumption of dairy and animal food, the higher the fracture rate. And fracture rate tends to associate with, uh, with uh, societies that are consuming more animal-based foods, it's very clear. Probably a lot of it attributed to the dairy itself. But also at the same time, uh, they're not getting the benefit of the plant material to help keep the bones healthy. With cancer, what is the primary difference between initiation, promotion, and progression? Which part do humans have the most control over? Well, those three stages, so to speak, are a little bit arbitrary, but they're descriptive and not bad to use. Initiation is the first stage when the cancer is forming. And by the word initiation, what, what that means, generally speaking, some chemical comes in or something else that's equivalent to a chemical uh, causes a mutation in the DNA that can change the DNA. If not repaired, it can change the DNA to actually be in a form that can give rise to cancer. That's initiation, that's where cancer starts presumably with, a, with a, a, a mutation. Just the first stages, I mean, we can be talking about hours, days or something where that kind of thing goes on. It's going on a lot. We repair most of that damage, but in any case, that's the first thing. The second stage is once these early cancer cells have formed from that mutation, if you will, we call them neoplastic or pre-neoplastic cells, those cells start divide, 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 eventually go into what you can see it as a tumor. That's promotion. That takes a long time, but usually relatively long, and certainly months, maybe even years for that to progress. The last stage is progression. That's when in the case of human cancer, they notice they got, they got a problem. They go to the doctor, you know, they find out they got a tumor, of course. Um, now we're talking about a stage where the cancer is getting more aggressive and oftentimes it's migrating into other tissue. So initiation of cancer, that's the time during which the cancer is forming. Promotion in the long period in between when it's being cultivated and fertilized and encouraged to grow with the wrong kind of nutrition. And finally, then they have end up with a disease that you know is pretty dangerous at that particular point in time. But we have almost done no research on that, that end stage, that third stage, uh, especially regarding the use of food. That's what my son Tom is doing now, uh, working with uh, stage four breast cancer patients. Uh, now we're talking about something you might qualify as treatment. And it brings up another uh, issue, incidentally. The plant-based diet not only prevents some of these diseases, that's very clear. It actually can be used to treat these diseases. That's, that's, that's the idea that I'm going to suggest is going to carry this argument really into the future in a major way. Because people like to know, what can I do with, what can I do with my problem now? What we're now learning is that you can reverse heart disease. You can reverse diabetes in just a, almost, it's amazing in just a matter of days, certainly weeks. So coming back to cancer again, initiation, promotion, progression. And during that second promotion stage, that's where Nutrition comes in play. And I, I liken it to the fertilizer in the yard, growing stuff. If we got the wrong, we're eating the wrong stuff, it's causing the cancer to grow. Initiation of first stage, that is caused by mutations 
And mutation is generally understood, generally understood to be resulting from, let's say, environmental chemicals, you know, or other kinds of additives, if you will. And sure enough, you know, that, that kind of thing can be shown to actually work. But that, that initial stage of initiation that occurs can be held at bay for a long, long, maybe for a lifetime, if we don't consume the kind of nutrients that cause that stuff to grow. Unfortunately, we put a lot of emphasis on that first stage, initiating which chemicals do what kind of thing, instead of being more concerned about what really matters, that's the kind of diet we consume, the kind of nutrition we experience. Same, same for cancer, this for heart disease, and diabetes, and a number of other things. What is the impact of nutrition specifically on prostate cancer? Well, the studies that I would like to refer to in a case are out of Harvard, I think, for the most part, uh, a couple of others. Uh, what, what it tends to show is that, and then again, we see this really regression line from right up from days from point zero on up. Uh, it turns out that uh, the greater the consumption of, this is some of the best data I'm familiar with, the greater the consumption of skim milk of all things, the greater the risk of prostate cancer. More skim milk, more prostate cancer, almost a virtual straight line. It's really impressive. Now skim milk, and you make a comment about that, skim milk as opposed to whole milk, skim milk doesn't have the fat. Skim milk is like a, a, a protein drink. It's animal protein and rich. And so the more we consume of that kind, the greater is the risk for, for prostate cancer. Uh, similarly to this risk for, let's say, blood, uh, breast cancer and, and urine cancer and, and so forth in the case of, uh, of women. Has your book, The China Study, stood up to the test of time? Do you feel just as clear and strong about your findings today as when you wrote it? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I have to confess, I, I wrote the China study with my son, who's now a physician, incidentally. But I, I wrote the China study at that time trying to summarize what I thought I had learned over the previous 30, 40 years. Uh, a lot of biochemistry, a little bit complex here and there. But it finally got to a point where I said, well, just, just a second here, I'm not... Oh, yeah, and I threw in uh, uh, the work of uh, Dr. Esselton, Dr. Ornish, Dr. McDougall, who had been working with people, you know, some years just a short while before that. Uh, and they were showing reversal of the disease, control of the disease. So when I wrote the China study, I wasn't sure what we we're going to see. Finally, kind of threw my hands up in a, in a literal sense. I said, just try it. Just try it. You don't need to believe me on all this sort of stuff. Just try it. Well, since that time, we've seen a lot of evidence people just trying it seeing remarkable results. And I then subsequently wrote the book Whole, which is sort of the more theoretical uh, explanation of some of these uh, things that we were reporting in the China study. Now we got the new study, why don't people get to know this? But in any case, the China study has really done well. It's still selling a lot. This is the 16th year. Uh, I have to tell you, it's been translated into uh, technically, technically, I know this is, 48 foreign languages. I know it's over 50. That's a lot. And uh, it's uh, nearing 4 million copies sold. Uh, I get, uh, I know it's, got, it's gotten around the world. I've spoken all over, all over the place, both in person as well as virtually. And uh, it, the China study is really, as I say, it's had quite an impact, especially when supplemented with the second book, Whole. Which is, the, which is the more scholarly interpretation, if you will, of what I had been trying to study. Yes. And our family, uh, when I started getting into this, uh, from the opposite point of view, I was in the beginning pushing animal protein consumption in the early part of my career. When I started seeing that that wasn't exactly right, we started to change our diet. And that was in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. We have a family of five grown children, 11 grandchildren, 22 of us were spouses. We all eat that way. I, my, my dad had uh, gotten heart disease early in life, even though he's a farmer, even though he was not overweight and all that sort of stuff. He's eating the wrong food. He had a heart attack when he was 62, fatal attack when he was 70. His brother had a fatal attack when he was 58. 
they were eating, and I was eating, of course, you know, in the family, eating a rich Western diet. My wife's mother died of colon cancer at age 51. Now, a lot of families can tell these stories, but obviously that's, that's impactful. I got to know things. I, we weren't particularly good, interested in going down that road. Now, next month, I'm going to be 87. Uh, so uh, I should maybe knock on wood, but you know, I've, I've been knocked on wood enough and I, I've seen the benefits. I've seen the benefits personally, big time. Our wife's seen the benefits, our children have seen the benefits. Our grandchildren have seen the benefits. So I don't, I don't even already need to go into the science and defend it. I can see the benefits as clear as crystal. Uh, and uh, that's the way it is. I'm, so I'm extremely enthusiastic for this. And I would really argue that it's time that the society at large get to know the true facts involved in whole food plant-based science. And I'm not talking about a, a, you know, a barrel full of uh, reductionist facts here and there, all these narrow little things thrown into the mix. We can find anything we want to do that. I'm talking about you know getting to the fundamental science and understanding how it works. See, I'm I'm as enthusiastic as I, I could be. When conducting research for the China study, what variables correlated with an increase or a decrease in cholesterol levels? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. The the cholesterol levels uh, have been used for decades, as you know more than a century, uh, as an indication of heart disease. The higher the serum cholesterol levels, the higher the heart disease risk. And, and in more recent years too, the higher the cholesterol level, it seems that the higher the risk for cancer and stuff. Well, cholesterol took on this, uh, had a, was explained that cholesterol, higher cholesterol levels in the blood caused by cholesterol consumption, that was the initial idea, uh, then caused uh, an accumulation of cholesterol in the, in the blood vessel, then and then you get heart disease. That's that's the old fashioned story, if you will. Um, actually, it, it turns out that the cholesterol in the blood level that is more influenced by consuming animal protein based diet, which is lower in plant based antioxidant kind of diet. So we get a different kind of cholesterol in the blood. The, local, the LDL, HDL you know, the fluffy kind, the dense kind, and so forth, it kind of breaks down. But my point about the cholesterol question is, cholesterol is, is, a, is a, broadly speaking, it's an indication of risk of Western diseases. But as far as individuals are concerned, the baseline cholesterol that people have is not necessarily, there's an exception to this, it's not necessarily a clear indication of how much risk they have for heart disease. On average, yes. But uh, I know people who have high cholesterol levels, baseline cholesterol levels, eating the right diet, they're doing fine. People with very low cholesterol levels having heart disease. Uh, so we can see this variation and it sort of begs the question, how important is blood cholesterol? Well, it's, it's, blood cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease, nor is the consumption of cholesterol itself the cause of heart disease. That's a very reductionist idea. Not that one cholesterol we're concerned about versus not in the blood versus the amount that you know causes heart disease. 